Good evening. Turn to your will tonight to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus uh, chapter 25 is where we are going to begin our study uh, for tonight. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, uh, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, uh, Paul says that we might have hope. Consider again what he says. Paul says, for whatsoever. That lets us know something. That lets us know that the entire Old Testament canon is inspired by God. Second of all, Paul says, whatsoever things that were written. Paul says that we have these matters written down uh, for all of us to study and to look at. And then Paul says that through the patience, through endurance, uh, Paul says all of these things they give us uh, much hope. Tonight, we have a lot of material to cover. Now, I thought about this from two different ways. I said, you know, I didn't preach long this morning, so I said, I'll just preach long tonight. <laughs> but I figured it'll be better to just kind of space this out over, over a few different weeks on Sunday night. That way, we can all certainly uh, look at this extensively and certainly gain some lessons from this. Tonight, we're going to look at the tabernacle from the perspective of uh, what it means to us in regards to uh, what the Bible has for us in the New Testament. Now, we often use the phrase types and antitypes, and we're going to look at the tabernacle tonight uh, to give us some clarification that, again, before we ever came into the world in the Old Testament, we constantly see signs and images and pictures of something greater to come, and that ultimately being the church of our Lord. It's interesting that when you study the subject of the tabernacle, one of the arguments or questions that always come up is, what about David? And my next question is, what about David? What about David? Now, the Bible, as we're going to see momentarily, everything we're going to show you tonight, of course, we're going to uh, prove that through Scripture. But just kind of the, uh, again, setting the scene for tonight, David was from the tribe of Judah. And many like to use the argument that says, well, David played his instruments. That may be true, but I know where David did not play his instruments, and that was in that Old Testament church, that being the tabernacle. David wasn't even allowed to go in that tabernacle, so the argument that uh, David used instrumental music, that, that just won't work tonight. Because again, we see that David was not allowed to go into that Old Testament church, that being the tabernacle. Let's notice more or less what we're looking at tonight. So the tabernacle sat on the inside of an enclosure. The tabernacle's outer court was 75 by 150, and the tabernacle itself was 15 by 45. Now, there was one entrance into the outer court on the east side, and this particular, uh, uh, this particular uh, entering, if you will, was about uh, 75 feet wide. As you make your way into the outer court, you're going to find uh, two things there, that being the uh, altar or, or the burnt offering. And then second of all, you're going to find a bronze wash basin or a lava. Now, as you make your way inside the tabernacle itself, that being the holy place, there the Bible lets us know that the holy place contained three pieces of furniture, that being the table of showbread, that being the candlestick, and that being the altar of incense. Now, separating the holy place in the most holy place was a veil. And in the most holy place on the far wall due west, there was only one piece of furniture. And again, that being the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, the Bible lets us know in Exodus chapter 25, verse number 7 and following, just how extensive this really was. The Bible there, of course, talks about how this mercy seat that overlaid with pure gold and how you have these two cherubims that sat on the top of the mercy seat with their wings outstretched, with their heads bowed down, and they're facing one another. Now, again, as we make our way throughout the material tonight, all of these represent something different within the New Testament church. But if you look at Exodus chapter 26 tonight, and that's where we want to begin, in Exodus chapter 26, the Bible there reveals for us, as was just read, look at verse number one. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. With his heart ye shall take my offering. From verse 3, I'm in chapter 25. Let me go one chapter over. I'm like, that didn't sound right. Chapter 26, that looks a little bit better. Verse 4 says, And thou shalt make a loop of blue upon the edge of one curtain. Look at verse number 5. Fifty loops shalt thou make in one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second. The loops that the loops may take hold one to another. Verse number 6 says, And thou shalt make fifty tatches of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tatches, and it shall be how many tabernacles? One tabernacle. We invite your attention tonight, second of all, to Matthew chapter 17. If you notice Matthew chapter 17 tonight, and you look at a scene from our Lord's life now, what's interesting is, is the chapter before in Matthew chapter 16. Of course, in verse number 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, his disciples came unto him, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, We have to be careful with what other people say. We don't have to wonder and guess what other people say when we can go directly to the word of God ourselves. And they begin to say, some say thou art Jeremiah or Elias or one of the prophets. Christ said, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. It's so interesting because in only a few days, again, at this point, Peter makes this great confession. Jesus you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Christ said upon that confession, uh, I'll build my church, verse 18, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. When you look at Matthew 17 and verse number 1, the Bible says, and after six days. What's interesting to me is what the Bible does not say there. The Bible doesn't say after six months. The Bible doesn't say after six weeks. The Bible doesn't say after six years. The Bible says after six days, it doesn't take long for people to want to change the word of God. It, after six days, the Bible says Peter begins saying something differently. The Bible says here in verse number three, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias. Verse 13, we find out who that is talking with him. Verse four. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is so good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles. Now again, if Peter is going to make three tabernacles, and our Lord said there is only one tabernacle, somebody's in some trouble. Jesus lived and died under that second dispensation. That second dispensation up to this point is still, well, let me rephrase that. In Matthew chapter 17, up till that point, that is, of course, uh, we know ultimately Jesus established his church there. Uh, but the Bible says that Peter wanted to build three tabernacles. Now, in verse number five, the Bible says, while he yet spake. I often, you know, sometimes when we read the Bible, we kind of run over phrases and phraseology uh, that we really don't pay a lot of attention to. The Bible says, while Peter was still talking, while Peter was still running his mouth, God had to intervene. It's so interesting that when our Lord was in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew chapter 26, and he is crying out to the Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. God wouldn't let that happen. It's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting how when Jesus uh, goes through the scourge and goes uh, through everything he has to go through, God doesn't say anything. And again, many take the position that uh, some way that uh, God abandoned Jesus on the cross, but of course we know that's just simply not the case at all. But of all the times people say God should have said and could have said, God doesn't say anything. But when Peter wanted to build three tabernacles, God said, hold up, wait a minute. God said, this is not by divine specification or this is not the standard that I have given. When you read Numbers chapter 2, you find the word standard there five different times. Does God have a standard? Yes. 
Does God have a pattern, Exodus chapter 26, verse 5, for us to follow? Yes. God has given them a pattern in the Old Testament, and God has given us a pattern in the New Testament today. Again, when you look at the Old Testament and when you look at all the specifications that went into them moving the tabernacle from the time they get out of Egypt to the time God gave them the instructions for the tabernacle. By the time you get to Numbers chapter 33, they would have camped some 42 times. And every time they set up this tabernacle, it had to be exactly the way God said. And it's so interesting because even from the tearing the tabernacle down and building it back up, it had to be done by divine specification. Later on in their history, when the Bible says they decide to put the ark of God on a new cart. And when they put the ark of God on the new cart, and the Bible says as they began making their way again throughout their journeys, that the ark stumbled, Uzzah put out his hand, and the Bible says Uzzah died. It's so interesting because when you look at the account in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and chapter 14, the account in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, David had already knew that the sons of Kohath were responsible for bearing the ark on their shoulders. Question. If this is not a big deal, as many say, why did God struck, strike us down? Why did he do that? If it's not a big deal, Let's go a little bit further tonight. When you look at the arrangement of the tribal or the camps, we read this information in Numbers chapter 3 and Numbers chapter 4 as well. Again, it's, it's so interesting because down to the very detail of the tabernacle, of putting it up, of tearing it down, God gives, again, specific instructions on how he wants this to be done. Levi... God said that he wanted the tribe of Levi to be responsible for the priestly duties on behalf of God's people. Now, Levi is going to have three sons, one by the name of Kohath, one by the name of Gershon, and another by the name of Mamera, and these are going to be the sons of Kohath. Two of these sons were going to be responsible for building the tabernacle up and taking it down. Now, the Mamerites were responsible for the heavier parts of the tabernacle. And so, again, the Bible lets us know in the book of Numbers how God gave them, uh, uh, God told Moses that he wanted those to have uh, certain objects to help them carry that particular uh, equipment of the tabernacle. And second of all, he gives the Gershonites, they were to carry the uh, lighter parts of the tabernacle. But the sons of Kohath were the only ones responsible for bearing the ark of God on their shoulders. They were the ones who were responsible for that. On the east side, we have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. It's, it's so interesting because, again, as you see them tear this tabernacle down, even the way they found out, it had to be done exactly the way God said it did. And so as they make their way, as they tear the tabernacle down, the Bible here says over in Numbers chapter 3 and Numbers chapter 4 there, how, first of all, how Moses and Aaron, how they will go out first, and how Kohath, how Gershon, and how Mamari, they will fall or they will foul exactly behind them. The next tribe that now goes out, is that of Judah. Judah and those three tribes. The bottom, you have Reuben and those three tribes. And then you have Ephraim and those three tribes. And you also have Dan and those three tribes as well. They go out exactly the way God tells them to. Is God a God of structure, of, of patterns? Yes. If we don't do it the way God instructs us to do it, we're going to be in some trouble. Now, when you look at that from the New Testament perspective, God has given us some, 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 some strict standards on how he wants worship to be followed. 
And again, it would be one thing if we didn't have a standard, a pattern for us to follow. We talked about in our Bible class in the back, in, in the back this morning, and I'll use this table as an illustration as well. This table is about, I don't know, maybe six, six and a half feet long. All of us in here tonight can speculate as to how long this table is. But the only way for us to truly know is to get an objective standard, that being a tape measure. And all of us can walk out of here saying the exact same thing. That communion table at South Florida Avenue is this, is this long. We can all leave out of here saying the same thing. Same thing is true with the word of God. Same thing is true with the word of God. Again, we also use the illustration two plus two is four. It's always going to be four. No matter where you go in the world, two plus two is always four. Now, my good brother Wayne and I, we didn't go to high school together, but I assume that he knows two plus two is four. <laughs> Even though we kind of, you know, two plus two is always going to be four. And it's so interesting because if man can write a book to keep all of the school teachers together, why can't a holy God give us a book to keep all the churches together? And it comes down to one simple fact. Somebody's lying. And it's not the God that's revealed in this book. It's not the God that's revealed in this book. God, he cannot lie and he will not. And, of course, the Bible that lets us know. But let's go a little bit further tonight. Again, we've already illustrated for you uh, the tabernacle, the outer court, the entrance, and what each part uh, or where each part it is. Now, again, we have the altar burnt offering, uh, the bronze wash basin or the lava. We have the outer court. Uh, we see the door that goes into the holy place. And it's so interesting because God instructs Moses and the children of Israel that he wants two fresh loaves stacked six to a column, and this was to be done not on a Sunday, not on a Monday, not on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday, not on a Thursday, not on a Friday, but this was to be done every Sabbath. What have they decided to do instead of two stacks of six? What have they decided to do three-fourths? they would have been in violation of what God said. They will be doing what God told them not to do. When you look at the account in, Le in Leviticus chapter 10 with Nadab and Abihu, of course we know uh, Aaron had four sons, Nadab and Abihu, Ithamar and Eleazar. All, 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 all four of them, no doubt, they saw their father worship God. And the Bible says in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, how they use strange or unauthorized fire. How do you... Uh, uh, how, how do you know what fire they were going to use? Because in Exodus chapter 27, God told them what kind of fire to use. And so they were already in violation of God's law. And again, in verse number three, really lets us know why they die, because they went against the holiness of God. That's really what the issue came down to. They went against the holiness of God Almighty. Look at Numbers Chapter 2 tonight. Well, look at, go back to Exodus chapter 26, first of all. In Exodus chapter 26, or Exodus chapter 27, let's notice one more thing before we move a little bit further tonight. In Exodus chapter, of course, in chapter 25 and chapter 26, he gives them more instructions concerning uh, the tabernacle within, without. Uh, he tells them uh, the types of materials he wants them to use in building this tabernacle up. But in Exodus chapter 27, verse number 21, the Bible says, In the tabernacle of the congregation, without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons, again, Nadab and Abihu, Ithamar and Eleazar, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statue for that forever unto their generation on behalf of the children of Israel. Basically what he says is as long as that second dispensation is in place, God says this is how I want you to worship me. Now, of course, uh, we know later on in their history, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was eventually moved into the temple, but that's a, uh, another lesson for another day. Tonight, we're just again, we're just looking at the tabernacle. Well, the Bible says this was going to be in effect for their generation. 
It's so interesting that before God gave us the second dispensation, he closed down that first dispensation. It's so interesting that before God gave us New Testament Christianity, he closed down that second dispensation. You see, church, God is only going to allow one way of worship at one point in time. In Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2, the Bible says God spoke directly to those fathers. James, uh, Job chapter 1, verse number 5, uh, we see that with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. We see that with those patriarchs. And then as Moses is receiving this law from God, God says, I now want you to worship me this way. In the third dispensation in which you and I live in today, of course, we know New Testament worship, the Bible uh, talks about that and gives us instructions on how we ought to do that. If you look at Numbers uh, chapter 2, I would encourage you in your, in your personal reading, read throughout the book of Leviticus because that book gives us, you know, is, is oftentimes when we're doing our Bible reading, we kind of jump over Leviticus. But that's a, a very good book as far as the explanation of the law that God had just given to Moses there on top of Mount Sinai. And Numbers chapter, look at chapter 4. Verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi after their families by the house of their fathers. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the, in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. Verse 5. And when the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come in his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Why couldn't the sons of Kohath, I mean the, the sons of Gershonites do this? Why couldn't Judah or, or, or Ephraim or Dan, why couldn't any of them do that? Because God didn't tell him to. God said, I want the sons of Kohath to be responsible for this. But even in that tabernacle, we have all these pieces of furniture. We can look forward to something even greater tonight. Let's notice a couple things that this tabernacle represents. First of all, we see uh, the courtyard, that being the world. Second of all, we see the altar of burnt offering, uh, which is a representation of the sacrifice of Christ. One of the things uh, that I learned last week talking to uh, Brother Kevin Patterson is it's, it's interesting because when you uh, look at the way in the tabernacle before they got into there, the way many of the animals were sacrificed, I thought this was interesting, it's almost as if they would take uh, the animal and they will put the animal there between uh, these two locks, more or less. And as the animal is sitting down, they will more or less come together, securing the animal in that particular lock. And that's how, more or less, they would uh, sacrifice that animal. And thus, uh, they would also move throughout the tabernacle uh, part as well there. But Leviticus chapter 9 and verse number 7 there, uh, that verse is in there because that shows us the type of sacrifices that were being offered before they were to, uh, second of all, wash their hands. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11 as well. When we're talking about the sacrifice of Christ, the only sacrifice the Father was going to accept was that of his Son. Jesus was the plan before the world ever began. Again, the church was not just some afterthought in the mind of God. Before the world ever began, God had a plan for us to be members of his body, that being the church. But third of all, we see the brown wash basin or the lava. Before a person can enter into the New Testament church, they have to be baptized. A person has to be baptized before they enter in the New Testament church. Because in that tabernacle, those priests, according to Exodus 29 and verse number 4, they had to wash their hands. They had to make themselves clean before they entered in. Would God accept them in their dirty? He would not. It's, it's interesting because most of the questions that people come up with, what if? How about this? How about that? The Bible has already addressed those things. And oftentimes, people have questions when they should already have answers. 
Number four, we look at that holy place. So interesting because there's only one way to enter into that holy place. It's only one way today to enter into the church of our Lord. And again, uh, that's through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, Acts 2, verse number 47, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 as well. Second of all, there are qualifications. A person can't just claim to be a member of the body of Christ without first meeting some qualifications. I can't just say by, I, I, I can't just say that I'm a son of Brother Brian King. I can't just say that. Why? Because I'm not. There are certain qualifications that must be met in order for that to happen. Same thing is true with the body of Christ. Certain qualifications must be met in order for you to be considered a member of the body of Christ. And then third of all, only those who are washed can enter in. Again, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. In the world in which we live in today, a lot of people try to disapprove baptism all types of ways. I don't have to be baptized. I can do it the way I want to do it. Not if you want to be saved. Not if you want to be right with God. The suggestion is always uttered. Why can't all these other types of baptisms work? Why cannot be sprinkled? Why cannot be uh, just sit and let somebody pour water on me? Why do I have to be baptized? Because that's what God said. First Peter chapter three, verse number twenty-one. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of His Son from the dead. Also, Romans chapter six, verse number three and number four as well. So again, we see the courtyard, the world the altar burnt offering, the, the bronze washed basin or lava, and then we also see the holy place. But going a little bit further, we see that candlestick in the holy place. It gave the holy place light. What gives us light today? It is the word of Almighty God. The word of God is that which gives us light today. Again, Psalm chapter 119, 105. Thy, 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 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 130, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word of God is the light in the world of darkness. We see the altar of incense, that being prayer. Again, Exodus 31 through 9, good, uh, good study there, good section of scripture. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Timothy 2 and also Revelation 5 and verse number 8 as well. And then last of all in this one, we look at the table of showbread. Again, how those um, two columns, six to a column, uh, the Bible says in, in Exodus chapter 26, those were to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And, of course, we can see the, uh, the parallel of that today. And we also see two more, the veil, which symbolizes for us death by which we leave the world. It symbolizes the abolishment of the Old Testament. It uh, is rendered, symbol, symbolizes the fact that Christ, our high priest, is in heaven. And then number four, the veil uh, being rent pictures the fact that the way to heaven has now been opened up. Again, Hebrews 9 and verse number 8. They're good, good, good study there in Hebrews chapter 9 and also Hebrews uh, chapter 10 as well. In fact, tonight we're going to conclude in Hebrews chapter Nine. So if you want to turn over there tonight, that's going to be the last text we're going to look at uh, together. And then last of all here, we have the most holy place, which again, uh, it is going to represent heaven. But I want to spend a little time now talking about that last piece of furniture on the far wall in the most holy place, that being the Ark of the Covenant. Now, again, the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with pure gold, and that is called a mercy seat. Within the Ark of the Covenant, we find uh, more or less three different items. First of all, we find the tables of stone, those two tablets. Second of all, we find Aaron's rod that budded. And then third of all, we read about a pot of manna that never spoiled. And those uh, each represented something differently that he wanted the children of Israel to remember uh, as they made their way throughout, um, throughout the wilderness. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1, the Hebrews writer says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. 
wherein was the gold pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded in the table of the covenant. Verse 5, and over it the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot speak particularly. That word mercy there in the Greek is just one word. And that word is, we also see that same word in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2, and Romans chapter 3 and verse number 25 as well. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 5, the word is mentioned as mercy seat. But in those other sections, again, 1 John 2, verse 2, and Romans 3, verse number 25, is translated propitiation. Even in the Old Testament, you have a law. None of us could keep perfect. And yet God covered that with mercy. God covered that with long suffering. But when you get to the New Testament, again, the Hebrews writer says that that mercy seat was covered. But what does it cover with? Same word is translated propitiation, which translate advocate. Or atonement is, is probably a better word there, atonement. Again, 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2, when you look at the original there, that's what, uh, that's what we find. And then in verse number 7 of Hebrews chapter 9, but until the second went the high priest alone once every year. That's Leviticus chapter 16, that being the day of atonement. They were to go in once a year on uh, one day of the year, and thus they were offered sacrifices for themselves and ultimately offered sacrifices for all uh, the children of Israel as well. So much more can be, can be said tonight in regards to uh, the tabernacle, but those are just a few thoughts uh, that we wanted to look at tonight. Go back to Hebrew, excuse me, um, Exodus chapter 25, chapter 26, and that's where we're uh, going to conclude tonight. Exodus chapter 26, one verse, Exodus 26 and verse number 6, again, the Bible says, And thou shalt make 50 tatches of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tatches, and again, the Bible says, there it shall be one tabernacle. One tabernacle back then is one church today. God, again, the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus chapter 26, God said, I want a place where I can be glorified. I can be sanctified. I can be set apart. I can be holy. But in the New Testament today, you know, we don't have to wait once a year, on one day of the year, to offer praises, to offer sacrifices up to God. We can do that every single day. The fact today that we are priests, that we're New Testament Christians, 1 Peter 2, verse number 9, the fact that I can, again, it's always good to ask people to pray for me and on your behalf, but the fact that I can go to the throne room of God myself and talk to God myself, that is a privilege like none other. We encourage you tonight that if you are not a Christian, to become one. Again, in the, in, in the world in which we live in today, we have to make a lot of decisions about a lot of different things. But being a child of God is something we need to get right. Just consider, what if someone gave you the wrong information? People often today use that feelings is a safe God. It's not. We talked about it in our Bible class this morning, and I'll share it with you tonight. In Genesis chapter 37, when Jacob found out that his son was dead, Jacob says, I'm going to go to the grave weeping over my son. And for 22 years, you know what? Jacob believed his son was dead. Why is feelings a not a safe God? Because you may have been given some wrong information. In Matthew chapter 7, imagine that scene in Matthew chapter 7. You have a person who's more or less in the, uh, in the judgment scene. And he's having a conversation with the Lord. And the Lord says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And this man says, Lord, I have my credentials. Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not do many works in your name? When people ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Very often, people get the wrong information. People get the wrong information. But when people ask us, what must they do to be saved? 
Hey, we point them to the Bible. We show them what the Word of God has to say. As John says in John chapter 10, the Word of God, it cannot be broken. It will not change. And thus, if the doctrine of Christ is not going to change, we need to get real familiar with it. Not just for ourselves, but we can help those who are lost as well. And we can help you tonight in any way. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.